start, uh, get us started here. So my first question is, what were the biggest challenges on farm around COVID-19 and how did you tackle those challenges? You want us to go first? Sure. <laughs> Sorry. Sure. Uh, so the labor housing was probably one of the biggest challenges for us, just making sure that we were abiding by all of the new COVID rules that were put out. Um, and that really, really, really forced us to get organized, just following all of that, those rules, um, making sure that we had enough supplies for everyone and the people that were kind of circling in and out, that was hard because we'd, you know, give people a bunch of masks and then they'd only work for a day and then we'd have to give people more masks. And so just making sure that we had enough supplies on hand um, and then getting information out for the workers regarding COVID, why we're mandating the masks, why we're you know going around telling people social distance, all of that stuff, and like in the cabins, especially after hours, those were probably some of our biggest challenges. I think. Uh, yeah, I would agree as well. I think housing capacity was one of the huge uh, impacts we had. Um, you know, given our our camps and how many people we can house. COVID rules that are now in place, um, basically almost cut that in half. So I think uh, the capacity was was just a big um, a big challenge. We were able to uh, work around that and, and find different ways uh, to, to ensure people had housing. Um, but there were many others, you know, even in our packing facility, we also had that challenge of this whole social distancing because in the field is very easy to do that, <laughs> um, but not in the packing facility. But but very, I think for us at Orchard View, it was it was the housing that made a big, big impact. So how did you guys solve this housing issue? This was the big one, right? What did you do? Did you bring in more housing? Did you change things within housing? What did you do? Uh, so, so we kind of, oh, sorry. So we kind of uh, like got a whole like organization kind of thing going. Uh, we had somebody that, you know, specifically knew like every time like a worker would come into town and they needed housing, get their information. Um, we were only, you know, housing relatives together in certain cabins. Uh, there was a whole, like one of our, our labor camps, we turned it into like, you know, a singles camp that we had to do like barriers and uh, like all those things to accommodate them. And Melissa, how about you? Thanks. Um, I think for us, the early communication we had with the workers really helped because we were ensuring that, you know, whoever's going to be coming to work was either an immediate family member or somehow, you know, related because of the capacity. Um, you know, we're, we're inclusive to families and that's always been our, our practice. But um, this year, I think what really made a difference was the early communication with them when they would call us to apply or, or check on their status. Um, and then also the option um, that we were told of from a few resources in the community was um, if the family members or workers didn't feel safe um, staying in a camp, they had the option of um, staying in a hotel room, which was uh, paid through by uh, one of the programs here locally. So there are many ways, and then the barriers as well. You know, we did a lot of structure um, adjustments <laughs> and, uh, and that kind of was, like I said, a, a challenge, but um, I think for us also the early communication with the workers really helped as well. So you said um, you use different materials to form barriers. Can you give some examples of what you used? Um, so we did like the whole OSHA recommendation of like the, um, it wasn't like a, it's like a thicker, uh, like clear plastic kind of thing that we did, uh, which we actually got a lot of our ideas from. Ian and them, so yeah. Orchard View helped yeah. <laughs> kind of pave the way for that. Yeah. <laughs> I think, oh, so you're talking about getting masks and getting cleaning supplies. You know, did you order them, you know, in March in advance? Were you getting them from the local emergency operations center? Where were you getting stuff from? So initially we, because when all of this kind of started, there was a lot of unknowns out there. And so we solicited some help from um, 
some relatives that sew a lot. And so we had them on duty making masks. So we had a lot of masks made prior to a lot of the other supplies being uh, available from different community resources. So we had those. And then once everything came available from the community resources, it was kind of that um, sigh of relief, I guess, knowing that, okay, now we're good. Like we've got plenty of masks, we're okay. But that and those initial few weeks with just the unknowns out there were a little bit stressful. Um, we did order a ridiculous amount of hand sanitizer at a ridiculous price just because that's what everybody was doing and we paid the price but it came in handy just knowing in the back of your head that like we have things to keep people safe um yeah so what were the best sources of information for your operations you know as far as the osha rules what you should be doing like covid19 related information where did you seek out information uh, for for us, we um, other than having early collaborations with uh, the medical experts, which in this case were like One Community Health, we worked uh, with um, Gail Bacon. Uh, she's their excuse me, <coughs> she's uh, one of their um, specialists there on on site, and then also with Dr. Miriam at the health department. Um, but for um, recommendations or or policies, established policies, we had an, at Orchard View, we would. Um, also work with uh, local, or I guess you would say kind of fellow <laughs> HR um, friends, for example, um, with Kathy uh, at Duckwall. I worked a lot with her um, because she sits on the Small Agriculture <clears throat> Employer Advisory Committee and, or, with Oregon OSHA. So she's, you know, kind of had that insight of what they were talking about, um, but then also um, CDCs, uh, and then also some of our attorneys have their own uh, kind of like COVID portal, <laughs> you know, coming up with policies and, and information. But obviously, um, CDC was the big um, influence based on just recommendations. Uh, and that's where we were would get most of our, and then I would just forward it to Dr. Miriam at the health department, ensuring that this is, you know, we were mir mirroring the same thing and we were not out of line. <laughs> yeah, we... We used MCNC a lot um, just to try to get the information out to a lot of our workers. And then Roberta Gruber with Fields, we fell back on her a lot as to just like, okay, if we have this scenario, what do we do? If this happens, what do we do? And she came out with a really great cheat sheet that just broke it all down really nicely for us. And so I printed that cheat sheet out and I gave it to everybody. I was like, all right, we all need to be on the same page. Um, but Roberta, she helped us a lot with navigating all the, the legality type rules with it. So something that just came up that you, you brought up in the earlier question was communicating this information out to employees. What were the best ways for you to do that? Were you hanging up flyers? Were you sending text messages? Was it just announcements or pre-trainings? What, what do you think worked best? I think we used, um, we used GNAWs a lot for um, like sending out text messages to employees, but I think also having as many uh, like supervisors on hand, you know, like in the orchard, reminding people about masks and, um, you know, hand washing, all that social distancing um, was also really, really helpful for us. Um, and then we had MCMC out when we did all of our signups and they just did like a, a general overview as to what COVID is um, and how to, you know, maintain kind of safety protocols out of the orchard. You mentioned Ganaz, is that the way? Is that like an app? <laughs> yeah, so it's actually Ganaz. Yes. Ganaz, yeah. yeah, Ganaz is a text message. It has also other features, but it's a very similar yeah. thing we use is exactly the same thing to send out communications and mm -hmm. information um, to the workers. Uh, and, and also just like flyers, because sometimes we can't fit all everything in a text message. <laughs> so uh, uh, sending, you know, links in, in the message really helped. Um, but I think, you know, just the education beforehand of what COVID is and what the company is doing and, and also, you know, really ensuring them that 
we're doing our best to to keep them safe at work and um a lot of a lot of that had to happen you know in collaboration with you know that you mentioned mcmc you know we did one community health and it's having them on site you know making sure they're answering questions and they're talking to medical experts instead of the grower right <laughs> so yeah that's a big deal <laughs> So were there changes that you made that made your operation run more smoothly? And this question is directly from conversations I've had with Dane. What do you think, Tiffany? <laughs> it made us get organized, um, especially with the labor housing. We were, we were not organized with labor housing, I'll be honest. It was kind of a, a wild free for all type of a thing. And this really made us like nail down how many people can we fit in a cabin? How many you know, how many people can we have in general to house and have housing available to all of them? Um, and so having that organization, which we probably, had it not been for COVID, we would still be flying by the seat of our pants. Um, so that helped us in the labor housing aspect. And then um, it also helped with picking and like moving people. So I don't know, maybe a week or two into it, we end up splitting off into two larger groups in our picking. And so we were able to look at how many people do we have, you know, at this cabin, this cabin, this cabin, and we can send all of those people in this group over here to pick, in this group over here to pick, and we know how many people um, were at each um, orchard. And so it just helped on that side, making sure that we didn't have too many people over here picking or not enough people over here. And it also helped following the COVID rules and keeping groups together and um, like people in the same house yeah. all together and stuff. Yeah. yeah, I think that really helped is it's just compartmentalizing the picking crews and same for us. It, it just helped run things very smoothly. <laughs> there were less, um, changes definitely that uh, there were before. Um, but also um, I think something I, I heard even Michael Mc mention was maintaining the monitoring, like the social distancing offices we assigned during the summer. Um, that just really helped kind of increase that assurance that to employees that there's people checking in, <laughs> you know, making sure that, that the rules are followed. Um, and then also uh, in the packing house, we moved to touchless, touchless uh, clocking in. So even in the field, we've used field clock before. It's already been two years. Uh, so we, we got away with the actual tickets, you know, which um, now we have that le less contact point, <coughs> excuse me, with the worker. Um, but I think field clock also really helped and is what we continue to use. <clears throat> So are you planning to keep some of these things going on in the future? Are you planning to you know, keep like using field clock type um, things in the packing house? Are you planning on keeping this housing stuff, hopefully more organized? Yeah, we, so we've already been kind of discussing how we'd like to see this year's harvest go. And the big thing is the labor housing for us. Um, I keep falling back on that, but that was just, it really was a saving grace this year having that organization and making sure we had enough people. Uh, so we're definitely going to keep that going where you've got somebody in line that that's basically all they're going to do is just keep the labor housing full, making sure that we're abiding by current rules, new rules, whatever comes out. Um, I think just, yeah, just keeping the organization, yeah. all that. And we use field clock as well. And that's, it is really nice to not, you can kind of keep that, that distance between the, the pickers and your checkers and mm -hmm. less contact is better. So <laughs> we love field clock. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, do you have anything to add? Um, I was going to say, I think, you know, all that was mentioned, <laughs> what I've just mentioned previously, I think there's some of the things we're going to continue to do. Um, but for, for my part, um, as far as like in, in my department, I wanna continue to work with um, with like the local resources we have here, whether that's the health department or, um, you know, one community health, but, or, or just seeking new collaborations um, because 
it was kind of <laughs> it's kind of funny to to see how many resources uh, the community has available, and to see that come you know come through during this pandemic has really been uh, it's been great to see. Uh, but I think there's a lot that we can still do, um, and I think as as growers, we should be more involved just for the sake of our employees, <laughs> you know, to, to keep them safe and to keep them, um, you know, able to, to continue to work. So uh, that is one thing I would add is that I think continuing the communications with, with the local agencies um, and bringing those resources to workers. <laughs> Uh, did any of you have any on-farm COVID-19 cases? And if so, how did you handle them? And who did you call? And hopefully it wasn't me. <laughs> uh, so when like ever we really like suspected that a person had it just, you know, from them saying that they felt ill or anything like that, um, we kind of would do a wellness check and um, just kind of, you know, give them recommendations of, you know, suggestions of what, what to do. Uh, we, I think at the beginning, I mean, I think it was all kind of new to everybody. So we would contact MCMC and um, I think at the beginning it was a little tough to kind of get through of uh, what we needed. And that's where One Community Health really, like they really helped us out. Um, they weren't our like appointed provider, I guess, you know, through all this, but they, uh, they definitely gave us a hand in handling uh, all of those, those concerns. Yeah, and um, we, we had cases uh, during the summer, but I, you know, given the number of workers that we, we get, I would say it was a fraction of that. Um, and all thanks to, you know, just, I, I want to give thanks to just the employees in general because of the uh, training and, and just the full-time employees being on it and, and the wellness checks every morning. Uh, we, we did those uh, temperature checks and check in with the workers every day. Uh, and yeah, One Community Health and, and again, North Central Public Health with uh, Dr. Miriam, they were really uh, just on it. Whenever I had a question, you know, I'd call her up and, and she'd be, be available um, even after hours, you know, can, so it's very nice to see that, you know, you had that expert on available to ask the question and, and be able to handle that because I'm definitely not a medical expert. and I didn't want to, you know, go into details with an employee as far as um, going through a medical questionnaire. That's, that's not what I do, but, but as far as contacting them and them being available really played a big, a big role. And, and I think that made a difference. <laughs> So this question wasn't on our little, uh, the questions I sent out to you guys earlier this week, but, um, you know, did you have issues with getting people tested when you needed to? That's been coming up a lot in our survey. Um, we, we had some of those cases where the employee reached out to us because they had made an appointment to get a test and they weren't going to be seen for like a week, you know, six to seven days. <laughs> and so um, that's where I'd get on the phone and, you know, I'd call Dr. Mimi and she's be like, nope, go ahead and send them down or send them tomorrow morning. Or, you know, it was just that being, having that second option, <laughs> you know, where it's like, okay, this isn't working. Then where, where else can we, can we get them help or, or just um, access to, to a test? <clears throat> So Tiffany, you, you were kind of shaking your head. No, I'm in total agreement with Melissa. We we ran into a couple problems where people couldn't get in for a while. Um, and so we reached out to a different resource and they were able to get them in relatively quickly. Um, and so that, that was helpful. Just, it was a little frustrating at first, not gonna <laughs> lie, but... Um, I guess then we just start going to the other person <laughs> where we knew that. So are you thinking like you would call, you know, MCMC and they couldn't do it. So you'd call North Central Public Health. Is that who you'd normally call or what? Well, MCMC call? was, was appointed to us. Um, and so every time, which we were lucky, we didn't really have any cases hardly at all. Um, but if something did come up, we would reach out to MCMC first and it was, it was, 
difficult. It was, you know, um, Monica is probably better at this because she dealt with it a lot more than I did. Yeah, it was definitely difficult. Like I would call in and uh, it was a lot of like, you know, well, we, we can't really see them because of, you know, certain symptoms that they had or, um, you know, it'd be better if they kind of just saw their own provider, but they have, I mean, a lot of these people that come into town here, at least, you know, for us, and I'm sure other, you know, uh, local growers and stuff, they're all from California. So they don't, I mean, their provider isn't here. And that's when then we would contact uh, One Community Health and we'd get them like a, a like a video visit, you know, uh, and then they would go from there. Sometimes when we would need some, you know, people wanted to get tested like right then, then we would have to go and we contacted somebody at MCM, so I can't remember her name. Um, and she would get us in pretty quickly in there to get tested and stuff. And so we just had a really great, great question that came up. Uh, what did you do to quarantine the people with the positive tests? And did you have available isolation cabins? So we, we went the route of the hotel. If we had somebody that needed to isolate, um, we never really ran into that issue because people just left. And like, we had one guy that tested positive and we were like, okay, well, you know, you gotta follow these things. And he ended up just leaving the next day. And so it's like, okay. So that was kind of what happened with us. They, for the most part, everybody left, um, yeah. but we had hotel rooms blocked out if we needed to send people over to isolate. Yeah, very, um, I don't remember anybody leaving. I, I, I can think of one person, but I think with, with, with us, with our situation, um, with guidance from North Central Public Health, they would set them up in a hotel room. We did have a designated um, camp that you know we, we specifically left open, um, not filled for uh, any, any case that that would happen or if it was a family. Um, but that was never, <laughs> never used. Uh, but we also had a, uh, here a, on site at, by our office, we did have a, a space where uh, a person could also be isolated uh, in the case that it happened, you know, closer to, to the office area. Um, but with the cases we had, uh, North Central Public Health set them up with a, with a hotel room. <laughs> Yeah, and there were North Central Public Health did a lot of work early on to get those hotel rooms, make sure that there were hotel rooms available. And then a little later on, there came this uh, quarantine housing fund. So if you're interested in learning more about that, we have some uh, some of our community partners on later in this conversation that would be able to discuss that more than I can. But that quarantine housing fund could provide for a hotel for people who were sick or also for people who just didn't feel um, safe in worker housing this summer. So we had a, a question about that come up in our, in our chat box. So it sounded like um, we have people here that work with One Community Health and people here that worked with MCMC and how did that go? And did, even, it sounds like you guys did some um, in-person trainings. Yeah, we, um pretty early on we contacted um Wonka from MCMC and um she kind of brought on you know a group of her people and uh while we were actually doing like signups and stuff like that that's when like before harvest even started they came in and they kind of provided information of like Tiffany said what COVID is and they did like little packages for the employees uh provided them information on how to get tested where you know a lot of really good resources for them, I think. Um, so, you know, I definitely give it out to Blanca. They, we called them during cherry harvest. We called them during our pear harvest. Like they were always there. Um, so that was, that was nice. And then, like I said, one community health uh, was like really great at answering any questions or seeing any of, uh, of the pickers and stuff like that. They weren't, like I said, our appointed provider, but they provided a lot of really good information for us. And Melissa, I know you guys did a ton up front with One Community Health. Yeah, we, uh, meant, like I mentioned before with Gail uh, Bacon, their um, emergency preparedness consultant, she, she and Gladys came on site from One Community Health and 
did a, a full assessment, you know, um, of just the, the business, I believe that was in April. And just to kind of help us prepare, you know, and, and where, where did we see any, any risks that we could mitigate, you know, just to ensure that people are, are, are safe and can continue to work safely. Um, so we did that, you know, a couple months before our harvest started. And, and I think that really set us up for a successful um, harvest. I mean, we did have, like I said, a few cases, but, um, you know, given the amount of people we, <laughs> we hire, it just really um, set us up. And, and same with Dr. Miriam, like I said, I could just uh, call her up, you know, and, and ask a stupid question. <laughs> and and uh, she'd make me feel really at ease. And I think that just understanding um, and, and having that sympathy, you know, really also shows and, and it helps because this was all new to everybody. <laughs> you know? It sounds like those worker trainings are really invaluable. And, you know, we have a lot of folks on this call here. I'm not sure how many of them are orchardists or HR folks for orchards, but the survey that Lauren and I are doing um, suggests that 76% of our respondents knew that One Community Health or um, MCMC were doing these outreach things, but only 28 people or 28 respondents uh, took advantage, or 28%, I'm sorry guys, 28% of respondents uh, took advantage of those opportunities. And I really want to um, really want people to use these things in the future. It sounds like it was incredibly helpful at reducing risks and just helping people understand that this information is coming from medical professionals. It's not coming from the orchardists and people may be more willing to listen to medical professionals than to their employer for a whole host of reasons. And you know, did, did um, Tiffany or Monica or Melissa, did any of you have any concerns about bringing these folks onto the orchard for trainings like this? I don't think any concerns. I think of anything we felt more at ease because I mean, at that time, I think it was still pretty, a lot of things were unknown and um, they were able to, you know, answer questions from our employees a little bit better than we could. So we were just kind of going off of whatever, you know, other people were saying. Yeah, same, same here. I think it's just, you know, accepting that, you know, it may take longer as far as like training <laughs> and orientation. Yes, it may take longer, but again, you're, you're providing uh, information, education, you know, uh, giving your workers that access to, to the experts, um, because that's ultimately how we were, were able to get through this pandemic is following that guidance. And um, we still, you know, our, our message to our workers were, uh, it's still your choice, personal choice. If you decide to test, um, <clears throat> we're not forcing you to do it but at least you have the information and you, and you make that choice. Um, and, and it's just um, being proactive, you know, not, not as waiting for something to happen and then react to it, <laughs> uh, yeah. but also having that just good faith effort, you know, to, to provide as much information about it to, to the employees um, and ensuring them that we're trying to do our best. You know, this is, this is what we can do and, and we're really there to, to help them because we need them for work. We can't just <laughs> demand. <laughs> so um, it's working together as a group. <clears throat> Will you guys have them back this coming year? Yes, a hundred percent. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think there's no question there. <laughs> Maybe some things we can, you know, reorganize and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and get better at, but, uh, but yeah, I, I would definitely invite them back. <laughs> Yeah, it just, it sounds like such a wonderful program and, you know, I'm hoping more people will use it this coming year. I, I know that their growers have all sorts of concerns about people bringing illness onto the farm, um, you know, from one of these people that are teaching in these programs and all these other things, but it's just, it sounds like such an amazing program. Um, what will you do differently this season after everything you've learned? I think uh, just similar to what I just mentioned, I think it's just reanalyzing some things that could be improved. Um, there's some things we're going to continue to do. Um, but as far as personally, I think I would um, 
have more of a planning for, for the education and the, the training part regarding medical access and, and what the workers should, uh, what they have access to and resources in the community is, would be a big focus for me. But I think everything else really ran pretty smoothly. <laughs> Oh, to I would say I, I would agree with that. I mean, I think we did a lot of changes this last year during the harvest that we're probably going to continue to implement. And uh, I guess as well as Melissa, just kind of get better information and organized for, you know, employees and resources around the community that they could really use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've never tried to We've never had contact, I guess, with a lot of our workers that come up prior to them actually being in town. Um, but now that we have tools in place to communicate with them via text message and stuff, I think that we're gonna try and reach out earlier on and just, you know, a little COVID reminder. You guys have your own masks, things like that. Bring them, um, uh, if people are, are planning to work for us again, just so that we can get a better feel, feel as to how the year is gonna go. Now I'd, I'd like to open the open this up to some questions from some of the growers that are on the line here. I know this isn't nearly as interactive as I like my meetings to be, uh, but if you have any questions, now would be a great time. And I'm going to start promoting some of our local community partners to panelists here so they can talk a little bit about what their plans are for this coming year. So we don't have any questions coming in from our audience so far. We have some, uh, some folks on the line here. We have Victor Mondragon from, uh, from uh, Hood River Public Health. We have Claire Rawson and Jeff Smith here from the next door, and we also have uh, Sandra Galvez here from OCDC. Uh, the, first, the question from both Ian and also from Adam here is, uh, what, are, what are organizations doing to try to get vaccines for our farm workers? And I just want all of the growers to know that we're working very closely with Oregon Health Authority. Um, you know, but there, there's not much we can do because there just aren't vaccines available in the state of Oregon right now has been my understanding. And, you know, Claire might have different feelings on that. And I've been in contact with our local county commissioners, our local public health uh, folks. And right now it seems like we're really at the mercy of the federal government sending vaccines our way. I'm not sure if everybody else feels that way, but that's how I'm feeling about this. And I think that all of our orchardists need to be writing letters to your congressional delegates to DC. Um, honestly, I think that that's what you need to be doing. I, I feel like I've done everything I can and I've reached out to everybody I can at this point. And I, I just don't know when we're going to have vaccines available. Jess or, or Victor or Claire, do you guys have any, any information on that? Hey, Ashley, I wanted to thank, this is Victor Mondragon with the Hood River County Health Department. I wanted to thank Ashley for hosting us, Melissa, uh, Tiffany, and I forgot the other panelist's name. Um, Monica. Monica, for sharing all of the experiences and information you all have shared. I'm actually gonna dive into the question, the first question that was brought up from one of the growers, uh, Ian. Hi, Ian. I know Ian from working at Orchard View um, when I was in high school as a young person or young lad, I guess you could say. The question that Ian asked was, what is our, your organization's doing to try to get the vaccines for farm workers? 
what I have been mentioning, I, I want to give some context to folks on this call. Um, I've been serving as the migrant seasonal farm worker, kind of like liaison to our um, EOC. It's the um, Emergency Operations Center here in Hood River County. I don't know what Wasco County might look like, but um, we've been disseminating all of the information resources that we've been trying to share with the growers and orchardists and farm workers alike throughout this whole year. So now we've arrived at the vaccine. Uh, the vaccine was approved uh, December 12th of last year by the uh, uh, Food and Drug Administration. And again, as Ashley mentioned, it's slowly rolling out, it's being distributed. Um, the last that we checked here at the Hood River County Health Department, um, we're going through phases. And so phase one is kind of like that little outline of phase 1A, like what includes phase one um, who's who's currently receiving the vaccine? Um, folks need to understand that this um, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines are two dose processes. So that means you have to take this one of the one or the other dose twice, one between 21 days and then the other um, after 28 days. And that's Pfizer for 21, Moderna for 28. So please, as growers, check in with who will be um, providing you with the vaccine, whether it's your local county health department or a medical provider such as MCMC or One Community Health, or even um, medical providers of your local doctors. Um, it, we're always letting uh, patients know to check in with your doctor to see if you have questions, if it's healthy to take the vaccine. We know that we have migrant seasonal farm workers that are kind of like in that 50 to 60 age range. So it's very important for them to ask their medical providers, is this safe for me to take? Um, just a quick review of the vaccine. It's not approved yet for youth. Um, it's a, one of them I think is only approved for 16 years and older. I think that's the Pfizer. And the Moderna has not been approved. Uh, it's only approved for 18 years and older. The reason behind that is because there's not enough studies uh, that have been conducted to see if it can get it approved for students. So now back to your question, Ian. What are we doing to get the vaccines out? Uh, we're slowly rolling it out. We're in phase one. Um, we're close to starting uh, the second dose for uh, first responders, uh, EMTs, EMS, and um, teachers were approved most recent as of last week on January 25th and educators to begin receiving the vaccine. Um, then we're slowly gonna get into phase 1B uh, that includes groups of 80 years old, 75, 60, 65, et cetera. So when is the vaccine going to arrive to migrant seasonal farm workers and orchardists and growers alike? The answer to that question is we don't know because we're trying to get information from the state and federal government what an essential worker constitutes. And we know that essential workers have been, um, we've been labeled like that during the course of the pandemic. Now we just don't know when it's gonna arrive. And uh, I know there's a lot of anxiety about you know the seasons and the harvest picking up in the springtime. That might actually be the time that it might be uh, available to us. So we're projecting around March or April. And I've seen projections anywhere from April to May or June. Um, sorry to interrupt you, Victor. I, I just, I'm, I'm not good at being, um, I guess, a politician here, but please, please write letters to your federal and state representatives and tell them how important this is for our farm workers, please. I think that that is that's the only thing left to do. Victor, Victor can't do anything else. I can't do anything else. Please reach out to people in power that actually can. Yeah, no interruption at all, Ashley. I just wanted to let folks know that the health department is under a lot of stress right now, trying to get the vaccine out as much as quickly as possible. And I agree with Ashley. The only way that we're going to be able to kind of push the vaccine or the groups up to the migrant seasonal farm workers is if us local people, community members write letters to our local stakeholders or even the state. We're uh, tediously sending out emails, how much vaccine are we receiving this week? And it's a week by week process. And so sometimes we get as little as zero or as 100 uh, vaccine packages. And it's very frustrating because then we'll get an overwhelming amount of like seven or 800 doses. 
and we have to get that out to the public as soon as possible. So we're trying to create client appointments. And I believe that it's going to segue to a point where uh, the health departments and local medical providers are now beginning to have discussions on what larger vaccine clinics are going to look like. And we're hoping that that'll include the growers and the orchards to be open about possibly providing these uh, clinic sites at your workplace. So we want to bring the vaccine to where the workers are. And so that's just kind of like things to think about right now, but not, no decisions have been made yet. Thanks so much, Victor. I really appreciate that information. Um, it's really helpful to hear from, from someone from the health department. I want to add too that, um, that I know for, for many of you and for a lot of us, the, the waiting is really frustrating and um, is really difficult at this time when we know there's a lot of urgency for the health of, of our community and our farm workers. Um, one thing that we are focusing on at the next door and with a lot of our community partners um, is the education and the information. Um, we know that there are different myths that cause fear um, around the vaccine and, and um, similar to what, what one of our panelists mentioned earlier, um, we really can't, can't say to someone, you must get the vaccine, um, but we wanna make sure people have trustworthy and accurate information. And so a big piece of that is making sure that information is available in Spanish, is in plain language, so easily understandable for for any of us in both English or Spanish. Um, it's tough to understand exactly how a vaccine works and all of the science um, involved. And so really making sure that we, um, that medical information is easily accessible and understandable, medical information pertaining to, to the vaccine and, and how it was created and, and, what, um, and what, it, what it means for, for us going forward. So um, several of our panelists mentioned how important on-site education was, and, and I'm so glad to hear that, and to hear that especially One Community Health was um, was really valuable to host. That's so great. Um, and so I just want to take this moment to say that I know One Community Health, as well as um, The Next Door and several of our other partners are working right now to provide on-site education about the vaccine so that when the time comes for, um, for our farm working community to have access to the vaccine, which I hope is soon, um, they will have already received the information that they feel like they need in order to make the decision. Um, so I'll actually uh, pass it over to my coworker, Jess, to, to talk a little bit about what that education might look like. Thanks so much, Claire. Um, yeah, and thank you, Ashley, for hosting this and organizing it. It's, it's really, I think, a valuable um, session that you've put together to get information out. Um, so as Claire was saying at the next door, we are aiming to help educate people and migrant seasonal farm workers about the resources that are available surrounding COVID, especially um, as things come up. So the next thing coming up is the vaccine. So um, being able to provide the uh, resources available around um, the vaccine that's coming up. And so we've been organizing this in a few different ways. One is actually on-site educational charlas um, that our uh, a coworker and I are um, doing. So that would involve coordinating with someone who's on the orchard to determine a good time to come out. And we'd be able to meet outside with a group of growers and the presentations are between 20 and 30 minutes and they're meant to be interactive and outside so that there's safe spacing between everyone. And so that those educational charlas involve COVID self-care, prevention, vaccination information. Um, we also talk about all of the different resources that we are trying to pass out to the migrant seasonal farm workers so that they know it's available in the community. And so that would be things like information on childcare, on local free access to food, on again, the vaccination process, what to do if you've, ha if you've lost work because you have to quarantine, uh, info on housing availability, on mental health support. So um, as we all know, there's a lot of really awesome resources around and we're just trying to make sure people know about them. So, um, in addition, we also at the next store have been creating a lot of different uh, 
educational videos, again, in Spanish. And so these educational videos can also be a part of the educational outreach we do. Um, and the videos will also be, uh, we're gonna be setting up TVs in a few different stores like the Mini Mart in Odell and the um, Guadalajara shopping market across from Rose Hours. So there'll be different ways, again, to get out all this, inform all this information that we have, trying to target locations where um, we think migrant seasonal farmers might be visiting. Um, and let's see, uh, oh yeah, along with the, the videos that, um, that, that we create, if you all are interested in staying up to date on what comes out, we're gonna be starting to email them out on the first of the month. So if you'd like to get information on the new videos that have been created, again, the first of the month is when we send out our reminders to whoever's interested. And it was really awesome to hear, um, I think Melissa say that she uses a texting system, what is it called, Ganas or something like that. Um, so that if we send you an email, you can choose to um, text it out to your coworkers using Ganas. Um, that because we are also hoping to start up like a texting blast with the the new videos that roll out. But one way or another, we're just trying to get this information to the migrant seasonal farm workers because they're the ones that can Im be impacted and um, their you know their lives improved by knowing what's available. So. I think I'm gonna stop for now, that was kind of a lot, but we're here to help um, you all and the farm workers as we can. So I've got a question for Victor, then I've got another, an older question for you, Jess. So Victor, um, we have some questions here about how the vaccine rollout will proceed. Do you see the vaccine going to places like Walgreens here in Oregon? I know in both Pennsylvania and Washington, you and New Jersey, you can go into a pharmacy and get vaccinated if you're within the, the group that they can currently vaccinate? Yeah, good question, Ashley. The answer is yes. Um, we don't know when we're gonna make that public. Um, we're trying to stay in connection with our local pharmacies such as Walgreens. I'm trying to pull up the information here. Walgreens Pharmacy, Providence Hood River Memorial, Hood River Fire and EMS, One Community Health, Walmart Pharmacy, Healthy Connections in Hood River, Columbia Gorge Family Medicine in Hood River, Summit Family Medicine in Hood River, Hood River uh, Dermatology, and then Heritage Direct Primary Care. And, and then uh, us with the Hood River County Health Department. I'm so sorry that we only have information in Hood River. I would love to share information on Wasco County or what North Central Public Health District and MCMC are doing. I encourage growers and orchardists to connect with those providers um, just to kind of get the updates and learn when we will finally be in that phase because I we're definitely anticipating that once this information is shared public folks can go to these um, resources or referrals uh, to, to begin the, the COVID vaccine process. So Jess I, there was a not to get off the vaccine topic, but there was a question before about the quarantine relief fund. Um, could you provide a little bit more information about that? Yeah, you know what? I'm, I think I'm gonna actually punt that over to Claire if she has a moment to talk about the quarantine relief fund. Yeah, I can definitely talk about that. Um, this is a fund that is um, we're really lucky to have here in Oregon. And it is, I'll put the um, link to the website in the chat for everybody. But essentially this is a, um, a quarantine fund for farm workers. Um, so to be eligible, the farm worker has to be 18 years or older and they have to have had exposure to COVID-19, um, whether that is they're waiting for a test to come back, they're waiting to get a test, they have already received a positive result and they're in quarantine because of it, um, whatever stage they are at along that process for some reason they are quarantining due to COVID-19. Um, and they have to be in the midst of that quarantine to apply. Um, but the point of this fund um, throughout the state is um, to be able to ensure that people can quarantine um, when dealing with COVID-19 symptoms or possible exposure um, and to not make it so that a financial financial anxieties is bringing people out of quarantine too soon, putting them or other um, family members or coworkers at risk. So I will put the, um, 
the link to the website here in the chat and i'll also put the phone number it's a fairly simple application and it has been open since about mid summer um, of 2020 it closed around the end of the year applications closed because they were kind of reassessing funding we're really grateful that it's reopened so please share this information with your um, co-workers and with your employees because we know that this is um, one of the big hurdles that that we all are facing um, how to help ensure that someone's getting um, paid time if they are needing to quarantine especially if if they've um, needed to quarantine for more than two weeks, which we know is the case for a lot of individuals who are dealing with COVID and sometimes paid time or paid sick leave um, only covers 80 hours. So this is a really, really important resource that is available. Um, and we really hope that you are able to share this um, with your with your coworkers um, and your staff. So I will put the information here. And we also had some funds that were available for housing as well, like the hotel rooms and rental relief, correct? Yes, sorry, Ashley, I was focused on typing. Um, yes, we did have those funds as well. Um, and Jess was really one of the um, outreach workers focused on that program. Jess, would you like to give an update on where those funds are at? Yeah, sure, sorry. My internet is kind of coming in and out. Um, but that was with Oregon uh, OHDC, Oregon Housing, were available last year, all throughout the year, for various different purposes. Um, providing housing was one of them by way of ho access to hotel rooms. And so that was a really great resource um, for individuals that felt like they didn't have secure housing or if they were quarantining. And those funds um, actually we used, we ended up dispersing all the funds that we had for that to disperse at the end of December last year. And then we were granted some more funds just this month and we ended up dispersing those already. And so right now we're, at, we're waiting to see if there's more funds that they can pass to us to, to um, funnel out to the community. But right now we we don't we can't offer any housing because those funds are done. But we'll keep you posted if they become available again. That's good to know. Thank you. I know there was a question before about um, how did people get these hotel rooms, and I know North Central Public Health did a lot for that. But this is another way that people could get hotel rooms for their sick workers. So we have a question about um, do we foresee more PPE? distribution for farm workers prior to the season. So um, Claire and I have a meeting about that at the end of this week. We have a lot of those uh, single use KN95s. We have a lot of those masks. However, we have, there are no more cloth masks. Um, the cloth masks that OSU received were donated by seamstresses from across Oregon to our program. Um, so I don't have any more cloth masks. I think I have 25 left at this point. Uh, I do not think that the counties will have funds to buy more cloth masks. So we just have these, these KN95 masks, which you all don't seem to prefer um, as far as orchardists, like you guys don't come looking for them from us. We also have some uh, several gallons of hand sanitizer at this point and we do not have any more cleaning solutions available for orchardists at North Central Public Health. And I don't know what that is going to look like in the future and I highly suggest that you start planning for purchasing these items. Uh, if you don't have them, if you want to be able to hand out cloth masks, you should start looking for them. You know, Mike um, or Mike, um, Mike Doak, uh, Claire, and myself, some of the other folks in our meetings are happy to put together a list of places you can purchase cloth masks and hand sanitizer. We just don't know or think that we will have the funds available to do that this coming year. Um, Claire, I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that. Not really at this time, Ashley. I think uh, we have some uh, PPE that, that we're able to to send when doing outreach. Um, but similarly, I don't think we are um, certain yet what our what 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 PPE will receive. So um, we're we're waiting to figure that out. 
and we don't know, you know, I might not hear anything for months. And then the next day, the National Guard is at my office with a pallet of masks. But there are those KN95 masks that nobody seems to want. Uh, if you want KN95 masks, give me a call after this and I can get you some or call Mike Doak and he can get you some. But we don't know if we're going to get those nice cloth masks again. So if you want those, if you want things like hand sanitizer, if you need cleaning solutions, order them now. And if you need help with that, of course, like we're all here to support you. So I think we answered those questions. Hey, Sandy, I know you've been hanging out um, really quietly waiting for your turn. Uh, do you wanna talk about what OCDC might be doing this year? Sure. Um, so, you know, last year was, I know, ever difficult for everyone, um, and it was extremely frustrating. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to know, sorry, let me block all of this off first, um, that, here we go. Um, as we're progressing and, 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 and moving on, um, our regulations and restrictions have changed and they're more lenient. Um, as you know, it was extremely frustrating for us last year uh, when COVID first, you know, hit, you know, in a couple months and, and then cherry season, especially in the Dalles, uh, we weren't allowed to have any kid in our program with any type of cough at all, no fever at all, even if we knew it was because they were teething or they knew it was one thing. And this affects all the farm workers because one of the parents has got to leave right away and pick them up then they've got to quarantine or decide if they're going to go get tested and trying to get it was it was a hot mess and it was frustrating to me because i've been doing this since 2001 and uh we get kiddos that come change a climate uh you know we're breastfeeding and now they're not and their tummies are upset that causes all kinds of things with a kid you know especially infants and toddlers and so uh, last year was extremely hard. We had to send kids home light, right and left and exclude them for multiple days. Now that has changed. Uh, now, if a ch child has asthma or certain things, we're able to let them stay in the center unless they have like a high fever and something else or, or an uncommon cough that, you know, that that barky deep cough that they're, you know, calling it the COVID cough. Um, so we are, we are planning and working and making sure that we are, as the regulations are changing and becoming a little bit more lenient, um, that we are able to serve more children and not be sending them home and not have to, uh, you know, pull families from the, the, the farm as much as we have in the past. Um, we also, last year, we're only allowed 10 preschoolers in the classroom, uh, which was instead of 20. So we were serving half of the preschool three to five year olds. And this year, as it, it has gone up to, tw um, to 20, and we're hoping it stays that way, so that then we can max out our classrooms again and serve as many children as possible It is very difficult, obviously, because we have to social distance and do a lot of different things. But we know that how this impacts the families, especially during harvest time. Um, I have Grown up, uh, worked in the orchard. My family's, I, I know what it's like. I, I um, And so we work really, really hard um, to make sure that children are able to stay in our centers. We know that it's a safer place and that it's a healthy environment. And we're able to, you know, keep, give that, that reassurance to families that they're good with, you know, that their kids are in a good place while they're here. Um, and we know that, you know, a lot of times um, it is difficult. And so that's where we're at this year. We are already in our planning mode. We don't have dates for cherry season yet in the Dalles, obviously, because it's all going to depend on crop. Um, we will be soon starting our Ramas program uh, meetings. And I invite any grower that's interested in, in that to attend. Um, because that gives us a lot of information. You're aware of what resources are, are available for the migrants that are coming into the area. And it also gives um, information about dates and we'd like to get farmers feedback so that we can go back to our agency that, you know, the higher ups and say, hey, but they're saying they need this. How can we do, how can we meet their need? And, um, and same in Hood River. Um, in Hood River, obviously, you know, we start a little later because of pear season. Um, but, and so we don't essentially serve children for the cherry season because it is smaller and we need all of the staff possible in the Dalles. Um, but we will open up about mid, uh, mid July um, to start prepping for, you know, being available for pear season and that runs until the end of October. And again, it'll be seeing the same regulations. We'll have 20 kids in a preschool room as long as everything stays well. 
and um, following the same regulations that have been opened up to us now to allow children to stay in the program unless it's specific to a COVID um, symptom. Thank you so much for, for that update, Sandy. That's really helpful. Um, do we have any other questions from our growers here? It doesn't look like we have any more questions coming in from our growers. I just want to again point out that as far as the vaccines are concerned, please write to your state and to your federal representatives. I have done all of the harassment I can at this point of our state representatives and our local liaison to the governor. So I suggest that you start harassing them um, yourselves. And I also want to say that you guys did such an incredible job this year. I've just been hugely impressed with Hood River and the Dows and the growers here. You've done an amazing job. And I, I hope that we can help support you into 2021 um, and having another great harvest. And thank you guys all for signing on today. I, I did record this. I don't think we said anything to you know, sensitive or horrible other than me saying to harass your uh, elected officials. So I will be uploading that to our YouTube channel. All right. Thank you so much, guys. All right. Animo a todos. Thank you.